Hi guys, welcome. I am uh, so happy you're joining me today. We're going to make this adorable bunny yoke knit sweater. We're gonna wait a minute for everybody to get in. But in the meantime, if you wanna tell me where you're from and what you're looking to learn and all that kind of good stuff, we can do that. We're just gonna wait just a couple of minutes while uh, people get in, get settled. Oh, y'all being quiet today. We're gonna uh, work in, I'm getting some yarn here. We're gonna work in bundle up. Oh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I grew up in New Jersey, so not far from there. And New York. Uh, we're gonna work in bundle up today. Um, this is a relatively new yarn in the Burnett line and I love it because it's soft, but uh, it also has, uh, the core of it is cabled and oh, Brooklyn's in the house. And so it makes it really sturdy, but it's also really super soft. So it's not going to like pill and fall apart, um, but it's super, super soft and a lightweight. So uh, it's really cool to, uh, it's, it's also washable. So this, I've been working in this yarn a lot the last month and I really, really like it. And not just because I'm teaching it here. This is, this is my new favorite yarn from Burnett. But more Brooklyn people, more Brooklyn people. All right. <laughs> I think we're good. Laura, if you want to do your thing. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. Today, we have Mary Beth Temple from Hooked for Life with us, ready for another exciting class. Today, we'll be uh, knitting the Burnett Bunny Yoke Knit Sweater. My name is Lara. I'm from Your Inspirations, and I'll be helping out with any questions you might have during today's class. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat and we'll be sure to make sure that Mary Beth uh, is able to answer all of them. We are now just gonna give you some time to get settled in, but feel free to let us know where you're watching from. And just a reminder that today's class is being recorded. So you can go and find the recording in the next few days at michaels.com slash classes. Um, but yeah, I'll have pass it off to Mary Beth to start the class. Now one point that I want to make before we get too far along, and I'll probably say it for any latecomers, you are going to knit this sweater on circular needles, but I am not. I am working on double pointed needles. There's two reasons for that. One is when you get to the sleeve of this sweater, you're going to want to work in a double pointed needle anyway because of the circumference of the piece. So I don't mind demonstrating that. But also if I was to knit even the six month sweater at this gauge, it has many, many stitches on a round when you get to the end of the yoke it would take me the whole hour class to knit two rows and you wouldn't get to see anything cool. So you can absolutely and should use 16 inch circular needles in the size you need to get the gauge, but I'm using double points just so everything fits on the camera. All right, so we're gonna switch to the tabletop. And I'm gonna see what I'm doing. Let's get a little light on the subject. All right, so because this is an, an intermediate class and because you are all so clever, um, I've basically done the beginning off camera. So what you're going to need, you're going to need the Burnett bundle up in three colors. We're using Icy Aqua, Marshmallow and Misty Gray. You're going to need knitting needles size US seven or four and a half millimeters and US eight or five millimeters. You're going to need those both in a 16 inch circular but also in double pointed needles, a set of four. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the reason is because as the circumference of the piece gets smaller, you can't really accommodate that small number of stitches on a 16 inch round needle. You need to use the double points. And again, I'm using the double points just in the interest of us getting through our day. So you will have cast on the given number of stitches for the size that you wanna make. It comes in six months to 24 months. Usually I recommend people get a pencil and sort of circle the numbers that are related to the size they're going to make, but we also have them color coded for you, which is nice. And so on your 16 inch needle, you're round. On the smaller needle, you're gonna cast on, you're gonna do eight rows of knit two, purl two ribbing. And then you're going to change the larger needle and work two rounds even, which means in stocking stitch in the round, two rounds even is knit every row, 
every stitch of every row. And then we're going to do the next round. Now, I do want to point out I marked the beginning of my round. It might be a little easier for you to see on your circular needles, but particularly on double points, you don't want to mark the needle because if I put the, the stitch marker right there, it's going to off the end every time I put the work down. So um, when I'm working on double points, I mark a stitch. So we're going to increase, this is our increase round and we're going to work it the following way. We're going to knit four, one, two, three, four, make one. So to make one, I'm going to use my right hand needle tip. I'm going to pick up the horizontal bar between those two stitches. I'm going to put it onto the left hand needle, bringing that left hand needle tip front to back through that bar. And then I'm going to knit that stitch in the back loop. I'm going to give it a little twist. And we do that because we do not want to have a big gaping hole where that new stitch is created. So there it is. So we're going to do that all the way around. Knit four, one, two, three, four, make one, grab that horizontal bar, lift it onto the left hand needle tip, putting that left hand needle in front to back, and then knit the stitch through the back loop. And that's a one stitch increase. All right, so we're gonna do that all the way around. I'm noisy today because all my double pointed needles are hitting my uh, hitting my work surface and <laughs> clicking around. Sorry about that. So remember when I've finished the stitches on one needle and that needle is empty, I'm going to use that to knit the stitches off the next needle. Also, you may notice when I'm working in double points, I like to give just a little extra tug to the first stitch on the needle. Otherwise, it tends to be a little looser than the other stitches. Now, of course, when you block your project, that's gonna solve a lot of that problem. But I do like to give a little extra tug to try and prevent the first stitch on every needle from looking more loose than the other stitches. Make one. So again, I've knit all those stitches onto my working needle. Now I have an empty, that becomes my working needle. And I'm going to knit the stitches off the last needle. So I've divided my stitches evenly on three needles and I'm using the fourth needle as my working needle. So once again, give that first stitch a little tug because it wants to be loose. We have a couple questions. Oh, go for it. The chat. So Mindy is asking if there's a pattern for, I'm assuming four-year-old toddler. I know this pattern only goes up to 24 months, but do you have suggestions if you do want to make a larger yoke sweater? I'm, I mean, if you were clever, you could, uh, work it out. The, the trick to this is going to be, uh, if you were going to increase the number of stitches that you're opening, the trick would be to um, increase your stitches in a multiple of 10. And the reason that I'm saying that is because the bunny pattern is based on a multiple of 10 stitches towards the top, of, uh, towards the bottom of the chart, the top of the sweater, which is the ears. So I would, um, I mean, honestly, it's a pretty big difference between a, a 24 months and, I'm sorry, here's my, my last make one is that between the beginning and the end of the round, just so you know. Um, it's a pretty big difference between 24 months and four. So there would have to be some math done that I cannot do off the top of my head. <laughs> 
we had one more question and this one came from Mickey. Um, mm-hmm. I have wondered what even means in knitting patterns for a long time. Could you explain that a little more? Yes, I will. And for the rest of you, I'm ending off my first color, my aqua, because we're not, I'm not going to use it again today. You'll use it again later in your sweater, but I'm just ending it off. Make sure you leave a nice long tail. I just cut the wrong yarn. Oh, well. <laughs> Make sure you leave a nice long tail so that, um, my goodness, I'm twisted today, y'all. No, I didn't cut the wrong yarn. I was right the first time. Uh, make sure you leave a nice tong- long tail so you can work it in later. So work even, all work even means is continue pattern as established, neither increasing nor decreasing. So if you are knitting garter stitch, work even means continue on in garter stitch. If you're working stocking stitch or stockinette stitch, as some people say, it means continue on in stockinette stitch. If you're doing an elaborate pattern, it means continue working that elaborate pattern. All even means is there are no increases and no decreases, so no shaping changes. All right, we're gonna move on. So the next thing is, so we've done our increasing. And now it says work first round of chart, reading rows from right to left, noting the 10 stitch repeat will be worked 10 times. I'm not gonna do it 10 times, I'm gonna do it five times. So I want to talk about this chart a lot because even if you are confident doing intarsia or fair isle, this chart has a couple of unusual qualities that I wanna point out. One is because we're going to increase as we work the chart, which we're doing so that the yoke can spread out. We don't wanna go straight down or our sweater is only gonna be this big. We have to get some increases in here and we're accommodating them in the bunny as opposed to between the bunnies. So when you first look at this and you see these blank spaces, that's unusual and it might be confusing, but when we're doing this, just ignore it. If you see a white space, it does not affect your knitting at all. Just ignore it. You'll see more later about why that happens. The other thing that I want to point out is this V right here is a make one increase. And again, it's unusual to see it in a color chart, but it's going to be in. All right. I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this. The V means the make one is going to be made in the color in which that V is sitting. So this is my light color. My make one's going to be in the light color. When I get up here, it's in the gray. So that's telling me the make one's going to be in the gray. So as I add the, so I've added these stitches, right? When I make one, I'm adding. So I have two make ones here, I'm gonna add two stitches. When I have two make ones here, I'm gonna add two more stitches. When I get up to here and I make those make ones, I've added those stitches in and now there's no white space. The other thing I wanted to point out about this chart is there's this one little guy here, which is a bobble, which we're gonna look at later. That's the only time you see it. It's the little bobble that we use for the bunny tail. And the other point I wanna make, because we are working in the round and not in rows, you are always reading the chart from right to left. We've done some other color work here or some other texture charts here where we knit right side rows, right to left and left, left, right. But because you're knitting in the round, you're always seeing a right side row. The right side of the work is always facing you. So we are only going to read the chart from right to left. Do we have any questions on the chart before I start knitting again? There seems to be no other questions. Okay, very cool. All right. I was saying earlier, I should have made a bigger copy of the chart because I'm blind, but uh, we're just gonna go ahead and and knit from it. So um, we are going to knit the chart as many times as you have bunnies. And I'm going to start with my marshmallow, my lighter color. And when I'm starting a new color, I'm just gonna pull up a fold like four to six inches from the end. I'm not gonna tie a knot or anything like that because I can tighten that up and weave it in later. So my first stitch is gonna look a little loose, but that's just because I'm adding a new strand. So the first thing I'm going to do is knit three with the marshmallow. Follow along with the chart if you have printed it out. Two, 
three. Now I have to add my misty gray. I'm going to do my same thing. Just pull up a fold four to six inches from the end. Now, some of you may have done color work that used bobbins, and that is intarsia style color work. This pattern calls for you to bring your yarn across the work behind the stitches that are in alternate colors. Those are called floats. So it's telling you to float your yarn behind the stitches that are in a color that you're not using. So I'm just going to bring that marshmallow. So I knit my one misty gray and now I have to knit three marshmallows. So I'm just bringing that marshmallow under my misty gray. There is a note in the pattern and I'm going to knit three by the way. There is a note in the pattern that says, don't twist your yarns. You don't have to twist because there are certain fair file techniques that require some pretty elaborate twining. That said, when I am knitting in this style, I always bring my yarn colors across in the same order. And the reason I do that is because it's neater on the back, because obviously you're gonna see these floats. So I always, when I'm bringing my new color across, I always bring the new color under the old color. It could be the other way around, but if you're consistent, it's one of those tiny, tiny little details that is going to make your work lovely. So I'm bringing my new color under my old color and I'm bringing it behind those three marshmallow stitches. Now, again, you will develop a rhythm as you learn this technique. You can't pull it super tight or the work is gonna to be too tight and it'll pull and it will not fit the child nicely. But you also can't make it too loose because you don't want those stitches to look sloppy, although blocking cures a multitude of sins. So you wanna bring that yarn behind. There's my one misty gray. And then I'm going to knit two marshmallow. One, two, and if I can count, that will have been 10 stitches. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So I have right across the chart, I had my one, two, three marshmallow, one gray, three marshmallow, one gray, two marshmallow. Now I'm going back to the beginning of the chart. I'm gonna do it over and over and over again. Every time I get to the end of 10 stitches, I'm gonna go back to here and start it again. And then I'm always going to travel my yarn nicely behind the alternate color. So I'm gonna knit for a little bit and show you. And if you have questions, now is a good time. So I don't have to bring anything across now because my last two stitches in my 10 stitch repeat were the marshmallow and my first three stitches of the repeat are marshmallow. So there's no presto change -o going on here. My yarn's already sitting there waiting for me. There's my three. And now I have to bring the gray over. I'm bringing the gray over under the marshmallow. And again, I'm paying some attention. I'm making sure that I'm not pulling it too tight and I'm not making it too loose. Here's my one gray. One, two, three marshmallows. One gray. Now, this will be far easier for you to see from a gauge perspective because you're gonna be on a circular, you're not gonna be messing with these DPNs. Again, the only reason I did it is because if I had done, there's my two at the end and then I'm gonna go right and do my three at the beginning of the next row, uh, the next repeat. One, two, three. Again, if I had, nope, I did that incorrectly. Well, now you're gonna watch me un, we call this tinking. This is called unknitting. I did the wrong color. So I'm putting my left hand needle tip in the, in the stitch below, right in the center. And then I'm pulling my right hand needle out, pulling out the yarn. See, apparently I can't talk and color, do color work at the same time. <laughs> Where were we? So there's my two at the end. One, two, three, one gray. 
three marshmallow. That should have been one gray. There we go. We got it back now. All right, there was my one gray. Here's my two marshmallow at the end. And then my three at the beginning. One, two, three. Gray, new under old. Then three more marshmallow, etc. Two, that's the end of that repeat, beginning of the next. One, two, three. <laughs> Gray. One, two, I very much hope I have 10 left. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Look at that. So we're going to do this is our last repeat. So we're gonna three of the marshmallow. One, two, three, one gray. Three marshmallow. One, two, three. One gray. Two marshmallow. So again, I'm not worrying that this last stitch is super loose. It's super loose because that's where my tail yarn is from when I cut my yarn. So I'm just going to tighten that up. When I weave that in, it will tighten right up. So the next thing you'll notice is because you have been consistent, you got a little yarn twist going on here. I take this opportunity to untwist it. You can either untwist the work, which I'm going to do because I just have this little tiny piece of work. You can also just untwist the balls of yarn. But you do want to untwist it at the end of every round. Otherwise, you can get a big tangly knot and then your yarn is not feeding nicely off of the skeins. How are we doing so far? Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, there were a few questions that came up. Right. One of them I know we mentioned at the beginning of the class, but there was a question about, can you do this pattern with circular, circular needles? Magic yes, and you absolutely could. The, the reason I'm using DPNs is to get a small enough sample that would fit on camera. So you are absolutely going to make this in circular needles. And I did say that at the beginning, but I did know that people were going to ask as they joined. Okay, Laura, anything else? Another one. Oh, yeah, we're getting some more. Um, this is what it looks like on the inside, by the way. Okay. Joya has said, I was taught that you should always bring the same color on top and bottom rather than the new color every time. I don't know what that means. Okay. I don't know what on top means. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, it, it's not that you're, I'm not picturing what it is exactly that you're asking. I would say this, if you are an experienced uh, fair isle knitter and you have a technique that works for you, then that is absolutely fine to do. If it works for you and you know how to do that, then that's fine. New under old is what I teach people who are new to fair isle. So if you have a technique that works for you, then you just run with it and that'll be fine. Um, and then we did have a question. Can we see your floats? Yep, we just, um, we, I just did that. Yep. And then Ashley is asking, are we doing the collar correct? Looks smaller than I thought. Again, I'm not knitting a full size sample. 
Um, and if if yeah. you if you were making the six month size of this, you would have cast on eighty stitches, and I cast on half of that, forty. So this is half size. So it said eight rows, so that's the right length. But this is this is honestly this is a teddy bear sweater. It's teeny tiny. And again, the reason is if I had a row here, I mean, already you're having to sit while I knit 50 stitches. If you had to sit while I knit 120 stitches, <laughs> we wouldn't get very far. So this is a teeny tiny sample and is absolutely not to scale. And that is also the reason I'm using the DPNs and not a circular. Perfect. So that was all the questions we have so far. Okay, now I'm gonna jump around a little bit guys, because again, in a half an hour, there's just not a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of uh, time to dwell on any one subject. So you're going to, so that was the first round that you've done. Then you're going to knit the second round and the third and the fourth. What I want to take a look at is the fifth, because this is the one in which we are seeing uh, those make ones happen, right? So again, looking at the chart, I have two existing stitches in marshmallow. I have a little V that tells me to make one and that V is sitting on a marshmallow block. So it's telling me that I'm going to make one in marshmallow. And then now that that has happened where I had two stitches, I now have three. I hope that makes sense. But I, again, this is not going to look anything like a rabbit when I'm done with it. I'm just honestly trying to get through techniques and not spend a whole lot of time trying to make it look completely accurate or else we will run out of time before I get to the next tricky part. So let's take a look. We're looking at round five. So we're going to knit two. One, two. Make one in the marshmallow. So bring that far up. And make one. So now I've turned my two marshmallow stitches into three. Now I have three in the misty gray, if I can find it. One, two, three. And then one in the marshmallow. Three in the misty gray. One, two, three. Now it says make one in marshmallow. So I'm going to switch back to the marshmallow. Do my make one. And that's what that little V means in this chart. And knit one more because there's one stitch after the V. So that should take me from 10 stitches to 12 because I have increased two. Let's see how my math is. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Clear as mud, let's do it again. Uh, and just, I know I'm switching topics a lot, but back to the woman that was asking about the Farrell twist, uh, the words that I neglected to say before are internally consistent. As long as you're internally consistent and do it the same way in your project every time, then you're fine. That's sort of my rule of life. So we made two in the marshmallow. We're gonna make one marshmallow. Now we're gonna to switch to the misty gray. Oops, I just did that in misty gray. I'm telling you these, uh, from the angle at which I'm looking at my camera, the, uh, the colors are a little similar. I keep picking up the wrong one. So there's my make one marshmallow. Now we're gonna to switch to the misty gray, three gray. One, two, three, one marshmallow. Three gray, one, two, Three, and then we're going to make one marshmallow. Three, 
and knit one. So I'm going to keep going, Laura, if we have any more questions. I see chat. Yes. I see chat whipping by, but I can't really, uh, <laughs> I can't really read it. So uh, if you want to ask while I'm trying to count, and you all, if I make a mistake in this color work, you have to forgive me because answering questions and knitting and running two cameras at the same time, I, I get a little break if I make a one stitch math mistake, okay? <laughs> Um, right, Laura, so what, we have a we question from, um, I believe it's Daya, uh, who says, I accidentally let go of a loop. How can I fix that? Do I need to start over? Let go of a loop. Like it, did it drop down? Because if it didn't drop down, you can just pop it back up on the needle. Like I did it earlier. One of my DPNs fell out and it was just hanging out like this. If you haven't worked it, just grab it. She says, yes, it dropped down. Um, I'm just going to hang on one second. Let me see if I have the right tool in my box. I do. I'm just going to do this really quickly because it's not in the parameter of this class, but it's a thing that people need to know. If it's dropped down like this, say, is that what it looks like? So what you're going to do is you're going to grab a crochet hook. You're going to put that, um, put that, put the, the one that you can catch, put it on the crochet hook and then go pull it sideways. See, it looks like rungs of a ladder now. You just pull the ladder through. Go to the next rung in the ladder, pull it through. Go in the next rung in the ladder, pull it through. And you can do that all the way to you get that's, uh, yeah, you were a stitch. And to you get to the top, and then you can just pop it back on your needle. I hope that helps. Oh my goodness, you guys, now I've completely lost count. <laughs> well, three, that's an ear. All right, so then one marshmallow, three gray. One, two, three. And then we're going to make one. And knit one. Okay, back to beginning next repeat, knit two. Make one. I know I'm making this look hard and I swear it's far easier on the, uh, on the circular needles. Uh, this was a lot of technique to try and teach in a one hour class, I have to say, but we're doing the best we can. All right, I'm on my last needle. So we're almost done with this little section. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is the bobble. Do we have any more questions about the color work while I'm finishing up this little section? Three. Make one. One. Oh, I can't believe I kept my math consistent. <laughs> I have the right number of stitches left. One, two, make one, knit three, one, two, Three, knit one, knit three, make one in marshmallow, knit one. So now you have gone from a 10 stitch repeat to a 12 stitch repeat because we added two stitches on every repeat. And again, showing you this does you absolutely no good because we've only done a couple of rows. But once again, here's my floats in the back. 
You don't want them too tight because if the work pulls this way, it's gonna look super tight and uncomfortable. And if it's too loose this way, then your stitches on the front are gonna look sloppy. All right, what is the next thing I wanna do? I wanna talk about this bobble. So in the interest of time, let's see how much time we have left. Yeah, we've only, we're more than halfway through. And there's one other thing I wanna to get to. So I'm just going to knit in one color from here on out because I don't wanna mess with color changes and then we run out of time for me to show what I wanna show. So you will continue to follow the chart, like I said. And if you, uh, start with the smallest size you're going to have your 10 bunnies and then when you get to the top of the chart just so you notice however many rounds you put after it is going to be dependent on what size you're making so if you are making the six month size that's your last round if you're making the 12 month size that's your last round and if you're making 18 or 24 months that's your last round but uh like i said let me just get rid of this additional strand of yarn i'm going to knit in one color and we're going to look at the bobble Oops, sorry about that. I knocked you around. All right, so for the bobble, uh, and again, I'm not counting because I didn't knit up, so my repeat is not my repeat is not currently correct because I haven't done the whole chart. But let's talk about the bobble. So you're going to knit up following the color chart till you get the stitch where you want to have a bobble. Let me just pick that one. And we're going back to the instructions on the first page. It tells you how to make the bobble, which is this. Knit one yarn over twice and knit one all in the, same, in the next stitch. So it's knit one, but don't push it off the left-hand needle. So you've but begun your knit one, then you're gonna yarn over. Knit one again in the same stitch, but don't push it off the left-hand needle yarn over. Knit one a third time in the same stitch. Now you can push it off the left hand needle and you have five stitches. One, two, three, four, five. So these five stitches are going to form the bobble. So at this point we're going to turn the work and purl just those five stitches. One, two, three, four, five. So there's my pearl five. Now we're going to turn. Knit five. Now, those of you who can knit backwards, this would be a great time to use that skill. Two, three, four. Five, turn again, curl five. Let me just make sure, yeah. Turn, curl five, turn, knit five, turn. Oh, pardon me, not curl five, turn. Curl two together. So I'm going to insert my right hand needle tip through both stitches at the same time. So I'm turning two into one, which is a decrease. Curl one. Now we have a big abbreviation, which is P2 tog TBL. So that's purl two together through back loop. So instead of purling two together in this direction, like we did the first time. Now, what I like to do, I like to push the stitches as close to the tip as I can get them without them falling off because it gives me more room. And I'm bringing my right hand needle through the back legs of both of those stitches. I'm gonna do that again because I don't think I caught both of them. There we go. Now I got both of them. You see, curl two together through back loop, pop her off. Now I've got three stitches in my bobble. Turn. Slip one. Pardon me, we're going to slip one knit wise because that's what the instructions say. Knit two together. Excuse me. <coughs> P2 
PSSO, which is pass, slipped, stitch over. So I have two stitches left in this bobble. Let me bring, sorry, bring it down a little bit. I'm gonna put a little bit of tension on the working yarn because I don't want it to fall off. I'm going to grab the second stitch in from the needle with my left hand tip and pull it over the stitch that is attached to the working yarn. But again, you see, I'm not, I've, I've not got a death grip, but the reason I have some tension here is I don't want both stitches to fall off. And then I'm gonna pop that needle out. And there is my adorable little bunny tail. So that is a bobble. I'm going to knit a little bit and we're going to do one more bobble, but I saw, I see the chat is active. So uh, Laura, do we have any questions you wanna ask me? Um, we seem to have had one question. Um, it says, it seems like a lot of stitches to float across the bunny's bum. So. Um, this is, I don't quite know how to answer this. <laughs> the, um, well, I mean, I know what I want to say. Um, the designer has suggested that you do floats and it is not for me to say that the designer that you should do it differently. However, I'm putting this as politically correct as possible. If the number of floats concerns you, you could also do this with bobbins and make it an intarsia piece. Just follow the, the color charts and use bobbins for your, so if I was going to do that, I would have a gray bobbin um, here and a marshmallow here and a gray here and a marshmallow here, etc. I would continue to float up here when you're over only floating past two, three, four, five stitches. I would do that just in the interest of speed because bobbins are a pain in the rear end. But if that, uh, what's our what's our worst case scenario here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So your worst case scenario is a 13 stitch float. Um, you could, if you wanted to, to switch to bobbins down there, but I know a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about. So you can just pretend that uh, all is well and, and not to worry about it. But the difference in color work, if you're using floats like we are, that is called a fair aisle style of color work. If you are using bobbins and there are no floats, that is an intarsia style of color work. I'm saying if the 13 stitch bunny butt bothers you, I would do fair aisle style to the point where it annoyed me and then I'd switch to intarsia style. But that is not what the designer asked us to do. So that is not what I am teaching you to do because the designer asked for something else. Does, I hope that makes sense. Um, another solution would be to catch floats, but again, it's not what the designer asked for. Um, I understand your point. There is a method for those of you who consider yourself advanced knitters, there, are, there is a method in which you can um, catch floats, which so if you're, if you're trailing the marshmallow across 13 gray stitches, you could ever so often, there's a way to twist the yarn and catch the float so you don't have a 13 stitch float that's hanging out loose. That is an advanced technique and it is far beyond the purview of this class. So yes, whoever said that, absolutely that is a thing that you can do if you know how, but um, not within the parameters of today. So I'm gonna do that bobble one more time. Um, so let's do the bobble one more time. So we're going to knit one. Don't push it off the left hand needle. Yarn over. Knit a second one. Don't push it off the left hand needle. Yarn over. Knit a third one. Now push it off the left hand needle. We have five stitches to work. We're going to purl five. One. two, three, four, five. We're going to turn and knit five. One, two, sorry, I keep creeping up there. Three, four, five and turn. Here's the beginning of our bunny tail. Purl two together. Purl one. 
curl one. Whoops. Curl two together through the back loop. Again, the reason I push it down is you have more room. If you're working, when I'm teaching beginners, I always say, when you're working on a stitch, make sure that you get it up to the fattest part of the knitting needle, because if you work too close to the tip, your work is going to be too tight. But the converse is also true. If I need more room in there and I slide it down towards the tip, I have way more room in there because that's not the full width of the gauge part. So I really do tend to just squiggle that down there as much as humanly possible, just to give me room for two tips. Hang on. It's really hard to do this technique on camera. So there I am, I'm going from the back. So there I am ready for my pearl two together through back loop. I'm just gonna sit here for a second so you see what I'm talking about. Going to pearl two together through back loop. Oh my goodness. Pearl two together through back loop. And then pop that left hand needle out. So now I have three stitches. And you can also see the uh, bobble is not joined on the sides. That's one of the reasons it has so much depth is it can just pop out from your work. So now I have those three stitches left in that bobble. We're going to slip one knit wise, knit two together. So that's knitting two stitches as one. Keep a little bit of tension on the working yarn. Grab the second stitch in from the needle. Just a little bit of tension here and pass that over. P-S-S-O means pass, slipped, stitch, over. Pop out that left hand needle. I'm back to one stitch and it's on the right hand needle where it belongs because it's already been worked. Um, I'm gonna knit, I'm just gonna knit even to the end of my round and then I wanna talk about the under on cast on and then we're gonna run out of time. So Laura, do we have any questions while I get to the end of my round? Um, yes, there was one question asking, you know, am I missing where the bobble is in the direction? So maybe just- Let me show you one out. more time. Two things. It's that little polka dot right there. So that's where it is in the chart. But if you want to know what the stitch instructions are, it's on that very first page where it's defined. Okay, I think that solves that problem. And again, I'm just getting back to the beginning of the round. I do want to talk ever so briefly about um, dividing for the sleeves. Um, only because the, uh, the pickup, if you've done raglans before, this will not be a new technique before, but if you haven't, it can be a little confusing. And uh, particularly where the pickup is on this is a little unusual. So I wanna make sure that I show that before we run out of time. Get my little tails in there so I don't have to look at them. So let, I'm just gonna knit across this last needle. Almost there. Again, the reason that particular one looks loose is just because it's a tail. And there's our little bunny tails. So let me get to where I wanted to talk about in the pattern. So you will follow along again with the chart and then it's going to have you work even in the aqua color for a certain number of stitches depending on the uh, size that you're making. And then it says divide for body and sleeves. So it says slip next 34 stitches onto scrap yarn for sleeve, cast on four, knit 51, 
do that again. Again, I'm just reading the numbers for the smallest size. I'm just going to do some random stitch counts here because again, I'm not knitting a specific size. But I like stitch markers. You can also use a piece of waste yarn and a tapestry needle if you want, but I prefer, pardon me, stitch holders. So let's see, uh, 10, 10, 20. So I'm gonna just do 15 in the interest of not losing my mind. One, two, three. Now I'm gonna do 20 because I forgot about my increases. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Oh, look at that. I had, it was the whole first needle. So again, if you would prefer to use a piece of waste yarn, which is softer, you can do that. What I do, if I'm going to do that is, um, let me just see if I have any waste yarn. If you all could see the mess around where I work, <laughs> you would be absolutely, all right, I'll do the tapestry needle method on the next one. How's that? Um, and then I'm going to, uh, so it says, bother, here we go, here we are. So the first thing it says is put the stitches on the waist yarn or the stitch holder, or what have you. This is the beginning of my round. Then it says cast on four or however many stitches for your side, because we're essentially in the middle of a round, even though it's the beginning of the round, we're, you know, in the middle of a piece, you're going to have to use the, um, sometimes called the cursive E, sometimes called the backwards loop cast on. I don't like it to cast on a whole project because I think it loosens up too much while you're working and it gets sloppy. But if you're in the middle of an existing piece of work, it's a really great one to have. So I'm gonna take my thumb and putting it under my working yarn. Let me put this down, you should be able to see better. So here's my needle, here's my working yarn. I'm gonna put my thumb under the working yarn and then I'm gonna grab this guy and go under it right through the center and pull it tight. So that is one stitch cast on. Put the yarn over my thumb, bring that needle tip from the front left up through the center, pull your thumb out, tighten it up. That's two. Three. Four. Now, if you see it, see it getting onto my needle, that's why they call it cursive E. Do you see the E? That's how you know you're doing it correctly. So there's your stitches that you have cast on. Uh, the next thing that you're going to do is knit. So you've knit some stitches. Oh, my math is terrible, I apologize. You've knit some stitches. You've put some stitches on to the waist yarn. You go knit some more stitches. All right, bear move me one second. I really need to get this last needle in here because it's going to drive me crazy otherwise. Do you have any questions while I'm resetting? There are no questions. All right, I just made this difficult for myself. I swear to Pete, you guys, if you do this on circular needles like you should, it'll be far easier. I just honestly, I thought if I had a hundred stitches in a round, we were just never going to get anything done. So the uh, drama that I'm having with the DPNs is my fault, not the fault of the pattern, just to be clear. So there's my forecast on stitches, right? And I wanna make sure I didn't twist them. There they are. And now I'm going to knit some more stitches. Now I'm gonna give that a little tug. I don't want that to be super loose. Two, three, I'm just making up numbers, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's see how many do I have left? Two, four, six, eight, 14. So yeah, this is close enough. Okay, so I've knit my second set of stitches. So Again, reading the pattern to make sure we're all clear because I'm messing around here. You're slipping anywhere from 34 to 40 stitches onto your scrap yarn. That's where I use the stitch holder. Cast on four stitches, which we did with the backward loop or cursive E cast on. Knit 51, 
stitches. And then you're going to do that again, which again, I'm doing it again just to play with. So if I wanted to use waste yarn, what I do is I grab some, some yarn that has nothing to do with my project. This is just close, so that's what I'm using. I'm gonna thread it to, through my tapestry needle. And I'm going to slide the stitch, I'm gonna slide the tapestry needle right, right through the center of the stitches to make sure that they don't drop. But of course, if they do drop, we already looked at how to pick those up. But I will say picking them up in color work is a little fiddly. So I can pull that tapestry needle right through. And then what I like to do, this is not, uh, this is a suggestion, not a, uh, not mandatory. I got a little carried away here. Let me pull that back a little bit. I honestly, after I take my needle out, I make sure I have enough so that, you know, it lays flat. I'm going to cut my waste yarn. And then I literally tie the two ends together in a knot because I don't want it to fall out. And when it's time to take it out, I can just cut it and pull it out and get it back up on a needle. The reason I prefer the stitch holder is you can knit right off of it. You don't have to go through the trouble of getting the stitches off the yarn onto a needle and then knit those stitches off. You can knit right off the stitch holder. Uh, but again, you would do that again. You would do your cast on and then knit the final amount of stitches. So uh, we're out of time. There's just one thing I want to point out and then I'll answer any final questions. When you're doing the sleeves, so you're gonna follow along and finish up the body. When it gets the sleeves, it says with four, with set of four larger, so the larger size, the double pointed needles, beginning at the center of the underarm cast-ons, pick up and knit half of the stitches you cast on, it'll be either two or three. What they mean, what they mean is these four stitches that we cast on, they're saying start in the middle, right? So when you pick up for the sleeves, you're going to knit the two that were cast on. Then you're going to knit across your sleeve stitches. And then you're going to knit the last stitches that you cast on. So the beginning of your round at this point is exactly in the underarm. It's exactly in the underarm it's right there. That's exactly where the sleeve begins. You don't see any, any madness. You don't see any uh, gaps or tight work. And then you're going to work down the sleeve, switching to the smaller needles to finish off. So you've started at the top. You've done your neck band and a few rows even, and then your first big increase round. You have made the number of bunnies <laughs> that you have in your pattern, and it, it will be different depending on the number of stitches you started with. And your increases are being incorporated into the bunnies. You're going to end the bunnies at the chart line that is marked for your size. You're going to knit the number of rounds specified in the pattern. You're going to divide up the way we just did. Put the sleeves aside, knit across the back, put the sleeve stitches aside, knit across the front. So you're going to knit this part down switching to the smaller needles at the end. And you can do all of that on circular needles, none of this DPN madness, all right? When you get to here, you're going to switch to the DPNs because the sleeves are small, but there's no color work here. So you're just working in one color and it won't be a problem at all. You're going to knit each sleeve down. So you're ending at the hem, you're ending at the two sleeve hems and you're ending at the bottom of your sweater. And at that point, all you have to do is block it and weave in your ends. I know we've gone over. Do we have any more questions before they kick me out? No more questions. All right, thank you guys so much for your patience. I know this was a lot of material, um, but I also know that they have shared some social media, including mine. And if you have a question, the best way to reach me personally is on Instagram because I monitor the Instagram channel. So, um, if you want to ask a question while you're working on the project, I know that hashtag Yarnspirations will get you attention of the fine people at Yarnspirations, and I'll shut up and let them talk about their other social media stuff. But if you need help from me specifically, or you want me to see what you're doing, 
uh, give us a follow on Instagram or send me a DM and that is monitored and I will absolutely respond to you there. But thank you so much for your patience. And then I'm going to let Laura wrap it up. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us today on this live community classroom with Michaels. We would love to see your work in progress photos. So be sure to share your work with the hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag your inspirations. And just a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and the recording for today's class will be available within the next few days at michaels.com slash classes. And that is all we have for today. Mary Beth, what is your Instagram if you want to shout it out? It is hooked number four, life LLC. My company is called Hooked for Life. So H O O K E D, the number four, L I F E L L C. Awesome. And that's all we have for today. So, yep. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day, everybody.